Welcome to United Body of Christ Church, an online ministry that offers streaming and downloadable Bible studies in video and MP3 format, all free of charge. The United Body of Christ app is also available in the Google Play Store and your iPhone App Store. Please note, here at United Body of Christ Church, we are not affiliated with any other ministries that may carry the same name. For our viewers who don't have Bibles, you can follow us along by visiting our website at www.ubcchurch.org and selecting the online Bible tab. From there, select the book of the Bible that we're studying from in the drop-down menu, then type in the chapter and click the Find Scripture button. If you are in need of prayer, select the Prayer Request tab on our website and fill out your confidential information and please be sure to indicate if you would like your name added to our online prayer list page. And most importantly, please indicate if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Lastly, we ask that you visit our prayer list page and pray for your brothers and sisters whose names are on that prayer list. And now, let us join Pastor Clarence for today's Bible lesson. God bless you, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and welcome to another Bible study. Um, as I always say, and as we've done before, Pastor Harden asks that I open us up with prayer, and then he will come forth with today's Bible study lesson. And so if you all would, I ask if we all bow our heads and just focus our hearts as we go before the Lord in prayer. Bless you, Father. Bless you, Lord. Lord of heaven and earth. King of kings, Lord of lords, ruler in the kingdom of men. We bless your holy name. We acknowledge you as God, as Father, as creator. We acknowledge you as provider, as savior, as keeper, as deliverer, as redeemer. We bless you, Lord. We bless you. We acknowledge that you are, God, you are the source of our strength, our peace, our joy, our hope. Father, you are our beginning and our end. You are the first and the last, Alpha and Omega. You are King of the universe, and we bless you and acknowledge you in the name of your Holy Son, Jesus. You are the one and only Holy Father, one and only all-wise, all-powerful, all-knowing, holy God, and we bless your name. We bless you in the name of the Prince of Peace and the Prince of Life the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. We acknowledge you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, God. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us to be saved. We thank you for your son, who is the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. We thank you, God, for making a way that we can come before you and cast our cares. We can come and talk to you. And we don't have to go through somebody who's going to give us red tape or try to try to be a middleman and try to make things hard and difficult for us. But the only one that you've set it up that we have to go through is the only one that you've given all power to in heaven and in earth. That is your beloved, your holy, your righteous, faithful and true son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, God, in his name and for him, we thank you. God, we thank you for your sweet and gentle Holy Spirit. We thank you for sealing us by your Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Father, our hope is in you. Our hope is in the return of our Lord Jesus. Our hope is to be resurrected to eternal life by the power of your spirit. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, holy and righteous God. Father, we thank you for this Bible study lesson today and that you would even allow us to be able to have a Bible study lesson. We thank you for allowing us to serve we thank you for blessing us to be able to come together and to fellowship over your word. And to be able, God, we thank you to be able to do it freely. Because, Lord, we understand that not everywhere are they able to do that freely. Father God, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are located in places and in regions where they are persecuted. Where they can't come together and have a Bible study without worrying about who's going to try to harm them. We pray for courage, God. We pray for courage to continue to minister your word, continue to spread your gospel, and to continue to love one another and fellowship with one another. We pray for courage. Father God, in those places 
like where we live, Lord, for maybe some of those who are free to watch this Bible study, God, we pray and ask if you would help us to be courageous, to be courageous, Lord, to stand for your truth, to stand for righteousness, and to not be afraid to speak your word, not be embarrassed to speak of our Lord Jesus, but that we would produce fruit and good works for the glory of you and your son and for the glory of your marvelous kingdom. We bless you, God. We thank you, Lord. God, I pray for strength for your people. I pray for peace for your people. I pray, God, and ask if you would bless each and every person to grow in faith, to grow in trust in you, to be committed to you no matter what's going on and no matter what's happening in their lives, that they would always fight the good fight of faith and to continue to stand no matter what's going on. God, we thank you. We thank you, God, for keeping us. We thank you for the many blessings. If we stop and look, Lord, you've bestowed many blessings upon us. We can't, your majesty, we can't look at what somebody else got and then think we ain't got. We have to look at what you have bestowed upon us, each individual person, and praise you. And thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you for your love and kindness. Thank you for your mercy towards us. Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us to be in our right minds. Thank you for blessing us to not only just have your word and to read it, but to understand it, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, God, for being patient with us, Lord, because truly, God, we, none of us can sit and say that we're a good person or that we deserve anything. But if it wasn't for your son, Jesus, if it wasn't for the blood that he shed, if it wasn't for his life that he laid down according to your will, we thank you, God. We thank you for your mercy towards us. You long suffer with us. You put up with us. And one of the things, God, I say and I thank you for, Lord, thank you because you didn't throw the towel in on any of us. We thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, for your new covenant. We thank you for engrafting your word in our hearts so that nobody has to, we don't have to try to figure it out or somebody has to tell us to know you because you've already put it on the inside. It's something there that we already know. And we thank you. We thank you, Holy Father, Holy, righteous, wonderful majesty. We thank you, most high, nobody greater. We bless your holy name. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy of all glory. You are worthy of all honor. If somebody says who gets the credit for something, God, it is you that gets the credit. And we praise you. We praise you. Hallelujah. We praise you. Hallelujah. We praise you. And we bless your holy name. And we thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to come together. Thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Thank you, God, because it is you that made your word available in black and white. It is you that made your word available where some of us can just pick up a cell phone and click on a video and start listening to your word. It is you that made it readily available and you have blessed God and given out, given various teachers and pastors so that we can understand your word. And we thank you. God, we pray that in all the world and on every continent, in every government, in every family, in every school and in every business, that your will be done. We pray, God, that no matter what it might look like, that we all, that your people, that we hold on to faith, that we continue to believe in our Lord Jesus and to do it courageously, no matter the persecution, no matter the troubles, no matter what rises. My prayer, God, our prayer, Lord, is that we hold on to our faith. And we thank you, God. We thank you for the gift of faith. Lord, you didn't make it hard to where we have to climb to the highest mountain and cut off a leg or something like that. You made it where all you said was to believe, and we thank you. And then you equip us with your sweet and gentle Holy Spirit to help us do this, and we thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. We pray your will be done with this Bible study. Father, I pray your will be done with the teacher. I pray that your will be done with each and every person listening. Father God, any ministries today that go forth to praise, to worship, to teach, we ask, God, if you would convict, convict, Lord, to teach your truth, 
to not water it down. And I pray for the leaders, Lord, in the churches that have to stand up and feed your sheep. I pray and ask if you would bless them with courage that they don't be dismayed or afraid of the people's faces or afraid of what somebody's going to say or afraid of people walking out, but that they teach your truth. And I pray that you and your son be glorified. We bless you, holy God. We bless your holy name. In the name of your son, Jesus, we ask all these things. In Jesus' name, we bless you and we thank you, holy God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm going to step off and Pastor Harden is going to come forth and teach today's Bible study lesson. Thank you for studying with us. God bless you. Well, God bless you, saints, citizens, and soldiers of the Most High God. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you and to welcome you back to another Bible study. My name is Clarence. I'm pastor of United Body of Christ Church, which is our online ministry. And again, on behalf of my family and myself, uh, here we are. We welcome you to another broadcast, another Bible study. Uh, today we are coming at you. Uh, we'll probably only have time to cover one for a chapter of Numbers, which is chapter 14. Now, there is a whole lot for us to have to cover. There is a lot for us to cover. Um, so I hope you are ready. I give honor and glory and, and might. I give honor to the Lord God for his power and his might, the way he leads uh, the way he organizes, the way he brings everything together for us. <coughs> Excuse me. We honor the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. We also honor the Holy Spirit, uh, who is the fortifier and the comforter. Amen. The power and the presence of God dwelling inside of us all. Uh, I also honor my wife. I bless God for my wife, who is also my help and my best friend uh, who opened up our broadcast today with prayer. So because, again, we have so much to cover today, uh, we're going to get right into it. God is the chef, the bread that he has prepared for us all to break and to receive. That is the bread of life, the word of God. That's also uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we honor the Holy Ghost that have invited you uh, your families, my family, and myself to come and to sup and to fellowship, to learn, to receive, uh, to, to fellowship, as we said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we give honor to the Father, His Son, and His Spirit for the coming together of the saints this day. Uh, without any further ado, in Jesus' name, let's eat. Amen. Uh, and you can see I'm trying to get busy because we have so much to cover here. Now, before we start Numbers chapter 14, uh, we need to go and at least revisit chapter 13 verses 26 through verses 33. So let's jump back a bit and uh, go back to Numbers chapter 13. We'll cover verses 26 going down to verses 33. Amen. Here's what the word of the Lord says. And they went and they came to Moses and to Aaron. We're talking about the 12 spies that went to spy out the land of Canaan. It says they went and they came to Moses and to Aaron and to all of the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh. And they brought back word again unto them or they brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation. And they showed them the fruit of the land. So what the scripture is saying is they brought back a report. Uh, they completed the tasks that were assigned to them. They were told to go out ahead of the congregation and to search out the land of Canaan, the land that was promised to their forefathers. They were right on the edge of it. The spies had a 40 day mission to go and to surveil uh, uh, the land itself, the inhabitants on the land. Uh, uh, the surrounding territories of the land and to bring that report back with visual evidence, with visual evidence of, of what was actually growing on the land. So they brought back the report. Amen. It says, and unto all the congregation and they showed them the fruit of the land. So that's the visual. That's the, uh, the, the evidence. 
And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of the land. And so they shows them, they said, as God has told us that it's a land that floweth with, with uh, milk and honey, it's, it's talking, he, God was talking about the richness of the land, how rich the land was, that it, it overflows with the richness of nature. When you look at the, the, the livestock, the trees, uh, the vegetation, the fruits, the various things that grow, when God told them that it was overflowing with these things and they brought back the report and they concurred, they concurred with God that surely it does, right? Nevertheless, there is a but. Here is the but. Here is the but. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land uh, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites, they dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So they're talking about all the people that they're going to have to conquer because all of the people uh, are surrounding the land of, they're either inhabitants or living on the outskirts of the land of Canaan. Okay? And and so, of course, they brings back this report. Instead of talking about how full and how rich and how plenteous and how vibrant the, 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 the land was, they begin to glorify the enemies that were on the land. Instead of focusing on the richness of the land, they begin to focus on the stature of the obstacle that they would have to to, to, to conquer, they began to focus on the obstacles that were in their way rather than what was on the other side of the obstacles. Amen? So, and, and, and all they had to do was plant this seed, okay? The people that haven't even seen the territories, they're just hearing the reports, okay? So, all of a sudden, uh, two of those, two of the 12 begin to, to, to say, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah, what they're saying is right. There are people that are big, but folks, come on, look who we serve. And let me get out of the way of the scripture and let Caleb tell it. Verse 30, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Caleb here in verse 30 was like, wait a minute now. Have, have y'all forgotten what our God was able to do to get us to this point? Have you forgotten what he did in Egypt? Have you forgotten what he did when we left Egypt? All the things that God has done and has been able to do, are you saying that those people are bigger than our God? I think not. Folks, gather yourselves together and let's go get what God has set aside for us to have. This is the voice of Caleb, okay? He begins to bring God. He's going to tell him that if God be for us, who can be against us? Verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. What they were saying is that they are stronger than our God. That's, that's what they were saying. They didn't believe in God who they were able to see. They believe more in those who they have not seen yet rather than believe in the God who resided with them and who were able to see the figure or the cloud, the representation of them, the cloud by day, the, the fire by night. They see him day in and day out as far as his form goes. The people they have not seen and were more afraid of the people than they were of God. Okay. Verse 32, and they brought up an evil report of the land, which they searched unto the children of Israel, saying the land uh, through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. It's too much for us. People, this is the kind of land that we're going to always have problems with, because when people see 
if by chance we conquer the land and we happen to stay there, when people get a chance to see what, what the land offers, they're going to try to conquer us. It's not worth it. This is, this is the mindset of the people. The people are also saying that that land will swallow us up alive because it's going to take a lot of manpower to, to, keep, that, to, to keep it going, to keep it looking like it is. It, it's going to swallow us up alive. It devour it in its inhabitants. Okay? It says, and the land through which we have gone to search it is the land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people we saw in it are men of great uh, men of great stature. Look at us and look at our size. We're, we're going to be swallowed up by the land. And there we saw the giants, the son of Enoch, which uh, come of the giants. We were in our own sights as grasshoppers, so we were so were we in their sights. So we needed to go back and read that because we're, as we begin to go forward here in Numbers 14, you're going to, we, we have to understand that there is a reoccurring theme. There is a reoccurring theme that constantly brings itself up and it begins to steal the blessings from the children of Israel. It begins to, to take things away from them, this reoccurring theme. And we wanted to kind of we want to shed light on that. We want to discuss that today. Because one of the things we have to understand is why is this written? Why was this written? Uh, the account of what happened then, why is it written for us this day? It's written for us to understand so that we don't perish in the wilderness. And so that we don't cause our blessings uh, and what I used to call, I used to call the enemy, the kleptomaniac of blessings. Okay, this is the term that I used to give the enemy. However, we become the enemy's accomplice because we permit the enemy to, to scare us off. We yield, we have the tendency to measure the obstacle, not measure the blessing. But we have the tendency to measure the obstacle. And before you know it, the first words out of our mouths is, I can't. It's, it's not my time or it may not be my season. These are the things that we begin to speak of because of what we have beheld with our eyes. And we, instead of walking by faith, we walk by sight and we find ourselves falling to the back. And allowing the kleptomaniac of blessings to once again pillage us because of our lack of faith in God. So we want to address these things today. And this is probably why in, in, in its entirety we'll cover chapter 14. But I don't see us proceeding beyond this for today. Now, Numbers chapter 14. Um, let's, let's begin reading. Numbers chapter 14 verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel, they murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God that we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore has the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? Now, hold your place there. Let's start moving about the scriptures. Go with me to Proverbs beginning at verse 18. Or let's just take a look rather at Proverbs verse 18 or Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21. Pardon me, folks. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. What's happening here that we keep seeing in, in, in the book of Numbers here? What, what is happening here? What, what's happening is that when we look at Aaron and Miriam, all the complaining, all the negativity, all the bad report 
those things are reaching the ears of God. Those very things that are being said, God is hearing this. And as he's hearing this, it's causing him to be displeased. And, 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 and what's happening is it causes us to be robbed of what God is trying to give us. Those things that God wants us to have. He wants us to prosper and to do well. He wants us to inherit the, the gift of eternal life that he has put up for us, that he has, he has presented us through Jesus Christ. He wants us to have life and have it more abundantly. These, this is what he wants us to have for ourselves. He wants us to, to, to be well and to prosper. But God that we're going to see is not going to force things on you that you don't want for yourselves. He's not going to make you have it. He, a, a parent could want their child to have all the advantages in the world, all the opportunities. A parent will want their child to take advantage of every good opportunity that comes their way to prosper them, to make them a better person, you know, so that they can uh, uh, be a, a good example and contribute well to society. This is what parents uh, want for their children to, to walk with God and to be a good person to contribute well to society. But all the opportunities that you may want for your child, they may not want them right now. They may not, that might not be uh, in, their, in, their peer, in, in their purview. It may not be something right now that they're looking forward to. They may have other ideas about other things. And no matter how much you may want it for them, if you try to force it on them because they don't want it, they're not going to do with it what you hope that they would do with it. Right? Well, that's how God is towards us. If we're if, if he forces it on us and he knows that we're not ready or that we don't want it, it doesn't work. We're not good stewards over it. We mess over it. We cause it to the to the to the um, to decay. Uh, we cause it, we cause it to be devalued because we don't take care of it because we don't really want it, nor have the responsibility of it for ourselves. We don't want it, right? And so God is the same way. And the thing about it is, we begin to voice when we think ain't nobody listening. We begin to voice our dismay and how displeased we are about certain situations. And so without you ever knowing it, when you begin to speak these things, what you're doing is, is almost like you're killing your future. It's almost like the things that God has prepared for you to have, you're speaking it away by giving permission to the enemy to become a kleptomaniac over it. It's, it's like you tell... When you begin to complain, it begins to rob you because what you're, you're speaking negative. You're thinking, first of all, that it, 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 think about what it does to God when you're constantly complaining. First of all, it's making it seem like God can't handle that situation that you're in, that his hands are tied. Well, you really bind his hands by not allowing him to address your situation because every time you complain about it, you take it away from him and put it back in your hands. You make the matters bigger and you make the matters worse. And if you learn to just be quiet and to be grateful and to be thankful, if you must speak, praise God for what he has done and what he is going to do, instead of dogging it out, instead of talking bad about it, you're killing it and in turn putting yourself in a worse state. Hmm? You got, and here's the thing about it. You have to give an account for these things that you say. It's better for you to be praised about the praises you gave than for you to be cursed about cursing the things that God tried to give you. Hmm? Go with me real quick. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 through 37. See, a lot of people may not know that you have to give an account for the various things, for every word that you say, you have to give an account of. And if I have to be judged by what I said, then let, then maybe, let me be mindful about what I'm saying if I'm going to be judged from what I said. Okay? 
So I said, Mark, what did we say? Mark chapter 12. Mark, um, I'm sorry, folks. Ma Matthew, rather. Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 through 37. Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 through 37. And here's what the word of the Lord says. O generation of vipers, how, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasures bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by, the word, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. We're going to read about that in Numbers chapter 14. And if Jesus is saying this, then it applies to us too. We don't want to kill or put ourselves in a position to not have God's blessings find us. You understand what I'm saying? We don't want to talk away our blessings. We want to praise God. Not for that for us to have blessings, but we praise him because we love him. And in turn, because he knows how we are towards him, he can't help but to be continually good unto us. That's how that works. See, if we bless him, we love him, we're obedient, and in turn, he takes care of us. He gives us, not only does he take care of us, but he gives us the desires of our heart. But when you're constantly complaining, constantly talking bad about people, places, and things, you're shutting God out of it. You're making it like he can't do anything about it, and it offends him. And not to mention, it's just a sin, right? And this is a constant theme that, that God begins to talk about how displeased he is with the children of Israel based on all their complaints because it's showing what they have in their heart towards God, how how um, the contempt, if you will, the children of Israel at that time had in their heart for him that they were always complaining and they could never appreciate what he's done because they, they, they couldn't get past that he, I don't know, I, to be honest with you, I don't know why they, what, what they couldn't get past. He brought them out of Egypt, they were slaves and then he was giving them their own land and for them to constantly complain it shows that they were ungrateful and like he owed them something which god didn't owe them anything okay anyway let me get out of the way of the scripture we'll get back into numbers but we also see this recurring theme of complaining all the time complaints and now it has come up to to the point that it's robbed them of what god had in store for them so so all the congregation, they lifted up their voices and they cried. And then they said, it w was God planned to bring us out of Egypt and to lead us into the wilderness and let us die here in the wilderness? What about our children? He put our children in position to be prey to our adversaries. You know, God is putting us in this situation. He don't care about us. This is what they're trying to say. Uh, voice, uh, verse four, rather. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Now they want to displace God. And let me tell you something. This is why we are particular, and this is why I always say don't have the pastor's relationship with God. I want you to have your own personal relationship with them. It's okay to follow us for, for Bible study. If you want to ask me what my biblical thoughts or biblical views are of, about a certain situation, things like that. If you need some clarity concerning scripture, it's, it's our job. Be, um, uh, servants of the Most High God, it's our job to feed you, to interpret what the word says, um, to pray for you, to edify you as we can according to the gifts that God has, uh, has given us. But we, can't, we cannot force you to do anything, nor will I even try. I don't want to lord over you. That's not what I'm called to do. And no person should be trying to lord over you. That is saved between, that position is saved 
for God himself, but for people to start ex exalting man above God. And that's what you're doing. In this situation here, they're saying, let us make a captain. Let us find a man that we can put in position that can lead us back to, to slavery. Let us replace God with man and let this man lead us back to slavery. That's what they're saying here. Let's replace God with man. Hmm? Look, they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return unto Egypt. It's for you to have this personal relationship so that you won't be, you won't be wild by words and terms. A lot of people uh, go to a place of worship or maybe a man of God will come to a place of worship and then the way he preach and the way he teaches, all of a sudden they done left from their place of worship and, and go to follow that man. You heard one sermon, that don't mean that, 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 that he was meant to pull you out of that place. He, he was only there to, 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 as a guest speaker to encourage you or to edify you. But some people have a void that only God can fill. And the first person that they hear speaking swelling words of wisdom, they replace God with that man. And it just, it's, that's not the way God intended things to be. Amen. So you have to have your own personal relationship so that when people begin to try to persuade you to go to the left or go to the right, you'd be like, I, I heard you. I heard where you was coming from. I can't go there with you. I follow the Lord. I can't go there with you. So that you can back up. That's, that's about having your own relationship with God. Amen. Anyway, let me get out of the way of the word because we have so much to cover, folks. So let me get out of the way of the word. Verse five, then Moses and Aaron, they fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel and Joshua, the son of Nun and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land. They begin to tear their clothes. They rent their clothes because of what they were hearing. You want to replace God with man and let that man lead you back to slavery. First of all, all, as the whole way that we got to the place here in which we are right outside of Sinai here in the here in, uh, in, in the wilderness of Paran, have you forgotten what our God did to their leader? Huh? Have you forgotten what God did uh, over there in Egypt? What he what he did to 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 their leader and his soldiers? And all of a sudden you want to go back there? Before we even hit the outskirts of Egypt, they're going to hang us. We're going to be slaughtered. You'd rather take your chances back there than live fruitfully uh, ahead of us? I, I just don't get that reasoning. But all it takes is one person, and, and, and you allow that person to speak into your life, and they done took you off your path. It's the company, a lot of times it's the company that you keep they can have so much influence over you that they lead you away from God. Hmm? They lead you away from God. And if they're leading you away from him, they're leaving you. They're leading you away from his protection, his guidance, his blessings. They're trying to pull you out of his kingdom. And so you got to be careful who you lend your services to, who you lend your members to. It's okay for you to, to hear what people have to say, but the instruction comes from the Lord. It's him at the end of the day that if somebody, if, if I'm listening to somebody and they say some things that I don't agree with, I shut it down. I just shut the whole thing down. You know, I just, I don't want you coming against a relationship that I got with the Lord. If I'm watching something on TV and they begin to say some things that, if I can't fast forward that mess, and a lot of stuff I like to watch that's recorded, right, so I can be able to fast forward. But if, if I can't fast forward and they talking crazy, I turn that stuff off. I don't want to have nothing trying to uh, seduce me. I don't have, want to have anything trying to usurp authority and trying to replace my God. I come too far. I come too far with him. I don't want to go back. 
So uh, let me get out of the way of the scripture. So verse 7. They spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it, it is exceedingly a good land. I know what you're hearing about the giants. I don't want to fo focus on the giant. I want to focus on the land because that land is ours. We're, we're meant to get the people off the land and enjoy the land. The land is ours. Let's focus on the land instead of focusing on the occupants of the land. Hmm? If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it us. A land which floweth with milk and honey. So what did they do? What did they do? They switched the narrative back to the land and not the inhabitants on the land. That's where the enemy gets us. What, what God is trying to give us, the enemy makes you or tries to get you to see the obstacles that you have to contend with before you're able to possess it. And you forget about what God has done for you to get you even to where you are. And you start, you start focusing on all that you have to contend with in order to be successful on the other side. And this is to some extent how, how salvation is. When you're trying to, when, when, when God uses you to minister to people and, and to, to try to lead them to, to the light which is in Christ Jesus and, and Christ leads them to the Lord our God. What the enemy tries to do to the people is get them to look at how hard this life will be. Uh, the enemy tries to say this, this, this life is too hard for you. You can't, you can't contend with it. Um, you have to give this up. You have to give that up. And you're no good if you can't have those things. Instead of you looking at what you could come into, you're looking at what you have to go through. The enemy shifted the narrative. And you gave the enemy your attention and you replaced his words with God's words. It's no, this is what you see the children of Israel do. Instead of taking God's words and using that as a guide to apprehend the land, they took the words of the ten spies to turn them around and to go back into slavery. That's what the enemy is trying to do to us. To speak to us according to our fears to get us to turn around and to go back into bondage. That's the, that's, that's the work of the enemy. That's his play. God is trying to speak through your faith and to get you to loose you from the shackles and to get you to live according to the liberty that's laid up in Christ Jesus. You're going to have to go through something to get it. But that path that you're traveling along, God is right there with you. And if God is for you, who could be against you? The enemy is trying to make you focus on the obstacles. God is trying to get your attention to focus on the blessing. Hmm? Verse 9. Only rebel not against the Lord. And that's what the complaining is. Every time that you begin to complain, don't you know that you're complaining? You're rebelling against the Lord God. The very th if, it's the, if it means that much to you to, that, that you have complained about it, then it, it, it should have affected you enough to pray about it. That's how I see it. If I'm going to complain, about what people, places, or what's going on with people, places, or things, then I should be praying. And if I prayed, if I truly prayed about it, then why am I sitting here cursing it by complaining about it? Let me, let me make sure you understand that. If it bothers me that much that it moves me to complain about it, then that's something that I should be praying about. And had I start praying about it, then I have no reason to complain about it. Do you understand? If, it's, if it bothers you that much to complain, then you should be praying. And then, after you're praying, start praising God for two reasons. Number one, he kept you from complaining. And number two, he's aware of the situation and he is going to do something about it. You got to praise him because, hey... He stopped you from complaining means that he didn't, 
this is not something you're going to have to address when it comes time that you standing before his throne. Be like, why was you complaining about that? Why would you do that when I told you not to? So those are the two reasons, immediate reasons of why you praise him after the prayer. Because he stopped you from complaining by moving you to pray. And number two, he knows something about it, so he's going to do something about it, right? Reasons to praise. But when you're complaining, I'm afraid that you're rebelling against the Lord God. And the complaint may not have nothing to do with him. In your eyes, it's like, how am I rebelling against God? I'm not complaining. I'm complaining about what my neighbors are doing or what my neighbor's neighbors are doing. That's that's what my complaints is because they are loud. All they do is, is they up all night. It's 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. I can't get no sleep. Pray about it and praise God about it that he stopped you from saying something negative about it. Pray about it. And I don't care if, if it 2, 3, Four days, four weeks go by. Still be praying about it. That's how I look at it. Pray about it and praise him about it. One way or the other, that situation, have enough faith to know that one or the other, one way or the other, that situation is going to be dealt with. It's a matter of man that God is concerned about because you've been to his doorstep a few times letting him know about your dismay concerning those people, concerning what they're doing. Pray to him about it. But don't be constantly speaking negative. Start speaking life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Start speaking life. See, here's the thing about it. The the whole reason that we start to speak negativity is because we fill ourselves with it. So what comes out of a man is what's already inside of a man. Therefore, you got to start changing that stuff. You got to start Think, you, you, first of all, if it's the people that you're hanging with, let them folk go. If it's programs that you're watching, stop watching those things. Fill yourself with things that are positive because you'll notice if every time you want to speak, all you do is complain, that's because you're filled with all that negativity. And nothing that anybody do will ever be good enough for you. So you have to start putting into yourself goodness, goodness, positive things positive reports. Start filling yourself with that and watch how you begin to, ch- to, to change the way you talk. You, you, you begin to, to speak positive, goodness, encouragement, blessings, joy. You begin to praise because you're constantly filling yourself with the goodness of the Lord and all that he has done for you time and time again amen we do 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 have a lot to cover so let me uh digress so we can continue here but all the congregation bade stone them with stones when 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 caleb out of the 12 spies only two of them stood up for the lord god and that's exactly what they were doing they were warning the people about praying about uh, uh complaining and they, was let, and they was taken up for the Lord God. They said, look, stop complaining. God has given us something, and you need to focus on the gift and not focus on what you have to do to get through it. Focus on what God has given you. Because you rising up, you're actually rising up against the Lord. Don't rebel against him. Okay? Do you think, and watch this, the Lord sat back to see if they received it. After Caleb and after Joshua took up for the Lord and tried to help the people by letting them know the land is too good for us to turn back around. After they ministered to the people, do you think the people received it? Nope. They began to talk among themselves about taking Caleb and and Joshua out. They began to talk about stoning them, killing them, because they didn't like what was being said to them. All of a sudden, the Lord appeared and held the children accountable for what they were saying. Look at the rest of verse 10. It says, but all the congregation bade bade stone them with stones. So, in other words, they were... They were talking amongst themselves and and saying that we need to take them out. We need to stone them. So they was talking about taking them out. 
And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle, tabernacle of the congregation before the children of Israel. The Lord had got to them while they were talking. The, the things they were talking about death because they've already cursed their blessings. And now those that still believed in God, they wanted to shut them down too. Those that, that walk by faith and not by sight, they wanted to take them out. Hmm? Because they walk by faith and not by sight. They didn't walk. The children of Israel at this at the time of the, this this event was occurring. They wasn't walking by faith. They was walking by somebody else's sight, somebody else's report. But then the other person, the other two, which also saw it, tried to get the children of Israel to walk by faith. And because their own faith was on display, talking Caleb and Joshua, they wanted to stone them for having faith in God and trying to share that with them. They wanted to take them out for it, okay? And the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? Will this people be an heir? Will these people be heir that they believe me? Or how long will it be before they, be, before they believe me is what the Lord is saying. For all the signs which I've shown among them. God said all the wonders all the signs, all the miracles that I did in their sight, when will they get it? How long will it take for them to believe me? I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. That is a powerful thing that God is saying here. Out of everything that I've done for you, what I did against Pharaoh and his armies, what I've done in the wilderness from the quails to the water out of the rocks, um, the manna from heaven, your sandals haven't worn down. When you look at the size of the, of the group that's traveling, over two million strong, now one of you can say that you missed a meal Narrow one of you can say that your clothes deteriorated, your sandals fell, fell apart. None of y'all could say that. It's been miracles. It's been my glory. It's been my wonders that have been upholding you and keeping you all this time. When will you, when will you possibly understand that I'm greater than all those things you have to contend with? So what, what did the Lord tell Moses? God is saying, I'm a, I'm a God that keep my word. And it seems like it's better for me to make a nation out of you, to make you fruitful so that you can multiply and take your children and bring them into the land. That way I've kept my, I would have kept my word. Okay. God, this is what God is saying. I, I just as soon as take these jokers out because they'll never, they'll never, they'll never get it. They'll never, ever um, get what I want them to have. Because they, they despise me. They don't, it's not that they don't believe in me. I'm, I'm there with them every day. But they despise me. They rebel against me. I just can't deal with that. This is what God is saying to Moses. And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it. For thou brought us up this people in thy might among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of the land. For they've heard that, the, that, the, that thou, Lord, art among the people that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, that thy cloud standeth over them, or standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of a cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. Moses began to intercede and began to reason with God because he sees that God seems to be fed up with all the complaining, with all the disbelief, and with all the rebellion against him. But Moses began to intercede. He says, Lord, if you kill them here in the wilderness, what will the enemy say? The enemies that are on the land of, of Canaan, they already know that you walk with the children of Israel. That you, They know that your presence is seen with the children of Israel in the day by cloud and in night by a pillar of, of fire. They know this. And... They know that you brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and that you're by their side day 
and night. If you were to do what you said that you would like to do, you're going to allow your enemies to say he brought them out of Egypt just to kill them because he couldn't bring them into the land of Canaan. You know, they're going to look at this as a sign of weakness about what you couldn't do rather than what the children of Israel wouldn't let you do. They'll shift the blame on you rather than shifting the blame on them. Don't give your enemies that kind of power play. This is what Moses was reasoning to God, and he was also interceding for the children of Israel. Now, if thou killed all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the hand, into the land rather, which he sware unto them, therefore he has slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long suffering and great of uh, and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgressions, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation. Pardon. I beseech thee the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. So basically what Moses was asking God is show great power by showing great restraint. Show great power by showing great restraint. I know these people are worthy to be put to death for the way that they have been towards you, God. I know this. But you are great in mercy. Pardon your children from the time that they left Egypt, even up to this time now. Pardon them. Don't kill them off in the wilderness. Pardon them. Moses was speaking to God concerning the whole, the whole congregation, the whole two plus million of them. And it was some powerful things what he said. He, he basically surmised by saying, this is a, a summary of what he was saying, show great power by showing great restraint. When you really want to do something and you choose not to, it's the mercy. It's mercies and you're laying up mercy for yourself. When somebody has done something awful against you, to you, by you, whatever it is, whatever the offense is, when you show restraint, it's the power of God that, that, that you're exemplifying that you would be merciful towards them, that you would hold off and hold back and not give somebody what, they're, what they deserve to have based on the offense that they committed against you. Somebody might be worthy to be slapped, to be reported, uh, to be told off, to be cussed out. You know, some, whatever, whatever it is that they did, they, they probably deserve what's coming. But when you take yourself out of the equation as to you're not being judge and executioner, that's a whole lot of mercy that you're laying up for yourself. Do you understand that? That's a lot of mercy that you're laying up for yourself. Scripture says, give and it shall be given unto you. In good measure, pressed down, shaken together, uh, run it over. It's, it's, the scripture talks about, oh, what you give, man shall give in return. If you give mercy, you can expect to receive mercy. And you never know when you need to cash in on that mercy. If you always judging people and always complaining about them and mean against them, and, and you, whatever evil they did to you, you commit evil unto them, you've laid up no mercy for yourself because you haven't forgiven. You haven't been merciful. But when you forgive, you are forgiven. 
When you're merciful, you can expect to receive mercy. Amen. So Moses intercedes and he reasons with God concerning the offense that the children of Israel caused, the rebellion that they had against the Lord our God. Verse 20, the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word, but as truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And so basically what the Lord is saying, I have pardoned. I have pardoned the children of Israel. Uh, and my pardon is as sure as my glory is that is able to fill the whole earth. So have I pardoned the children of Israel. That's, that's what he's saying there. But then he gives a however. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. Now God is saying, yeah, I'll forgive them as a whole. I'll pardon their transgressions. But here is what he's saying. They didn't want it at the time it was being offered. God takes it off the table. He, took, he takes it off the table. Now it's not theirs. So he's saying what, he's, what, he's, what his plan is to be going forward is since they didn't want it, I'm going to offer it to their children. See, here's the thing you have to understand. Just because God forgave you don't mean that he's going to put it back into your hands again. That part is done. Those are seeds that you sown that still have to grow. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you sow seeds of discord, when you sin, God will forgive you for the offense, but the transgression still went out from you. Do you understand? It is, it, he's not going to go into the ground and pull up the weed that you, that you sown. That still is going to be allowed to grow because you put it out there. This death and life is in the power of the tongue. This is why God is saying these things. When you commit the offense, you may commit the offense in the marriage, at your job, your workplace, your family, whatever you've done. You are still forgiven. But if that person still has a reaction to what you've done, you can't confuse forgiveness with moving forward. Those two is not on the same pair. They're, they're, they're not the same. You can still be forgiven, but you got to pay for things that you've done moving forward. If you go and you rob a bank, and then two days later, you found the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you found that he loves you because he was never lost. So, <laughs> so you stumbled upon his love and his kindness and you received his gift of salvation <clears throat> and you confess Jesus as Lord. But two days prior to that, you robbed a bank. You stole the money. Today, you may, you, you'll go and you'll return the money because you found the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, he was never lost, but you know, just to entertain it for a moment. Guess what? Even though you returned the money, you still committed the offense. And that part has to be dealt with. Do you understand that? So Jesus forgave you for robbing the bank. And, and not you wasn't just robbing the bank, but all the things that you've done against him that led up to you robbing the bank. He forgives you for all of that. The problem is all the crimes that you've done leading up to his forgiveness, the two doesn't go just because he forgave you you still have to contend with the crimes or the offenses that you committed you still have to now he the difference is he is going to be with you as you go through it do you understand he's going to be with you as you go through it and he might even give you some favor to where the penalty may not be as harsh but it's not taken off the table as far as that goes. You're still going to have to contend with the wrongs that you've done. Okay. Now, the, God is saying here in the same, in the same breath, oh, yeah, I'm going to forgive them. I'll forgive them. I'll pardon their transgression. 
I'm going to see to it that their descendants get into the in, into the land. But all of those that rebelled against me, they're not because they didn't want it. It's off the table. They can't have it because they shot it down when it was offered to them. God, I've been offering them that from the time that they were in Egypt to the time that he brought them out of Egypt. He had offered it to them and said, look, it's time for you to go get what I promised your fathers that I would give to you. And when they came close to receiving it, they complained. They said, it's to, it, uh -uh, we don't, if we got to go through the giants and not alone just going through the giants, but the land itself is too much for us. God was like, ah, that's it. It's off the table. Yeah, I forgive them, but it's still off the table. Okay, so we want to understand that. I don't want I want to make sure that you understand there is a difference between forgiveness. You can't confuse forgiveness with moving forward to where you think that if you mess up and you repent for the mess up that you good and you can go forward. You still got to go through the, the process of the offense or, or the destruction that the offense caused. Amen. Again. Now, God speaks about the 10 times. Um, in verse 22, he says, because of all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me or provoked me these 10 times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Now, God said they provoked him 10 times. So guess what? We're going to cover the 10 times that they provoked him and, and how it led to where, what's happening to them now. Okay? Now, let's go back. You know what I've done in my notes? I've, I've numbered 1 through 10. And I went down and, and, I, and as I uh, numbered 1 through 10, I also wrote down the chapter the book and the verses that reference that particular offense. And so we got 10 lines with 10 different offenses. And when, as God concludes that they've provoked at me these 10 times. So let's go back and review them. We'll be shifting around in the book of Exodus uh, until we get back up to numbers. So hold your place here. We st we're stopping here at uh, verse 23, we've read 23, hold your place and let's go back to Exodus chapter 14, beginning at verse 10. Exodus chapter 14, and we'll begin at verse 10. Okay, beginning at verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel, they cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. For every idle word men say, he has to give an account. So God heard what they said, but he didn't do anything about it. He heard it and, and he saved it because everything that you say you have to give an account, that means it's being recorded. Everything that you're saying is being recorded. God heard them speak as one voice saying, we told you when you try to pull us out of Egypt, we told you that it's better for us to stay here and live as slaves than to let you lead us to freedom. It's better for us to be here. You know, we told you now look at where we are. See, so that was the first. So that's line number one. Remember, God said these 10 times, so we got nine to go. Go with me to Exodus chapter 15. Let's take a look at verses 22 through 25. Verses chapter 15, Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 to 25. Here's what the word of the Lord says. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness, and they found no water. And when they came to Marah, to, to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the na they named it 
or therefore the name of it was called Mera, meaning bitter. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? And remember, as they murmur against Moses, as they complain, that's what that word murmur is, they're complaining. As they complain against Moses, they're really complaining against God. Keep that in mind. If you're complaining against, uh, as they're complaining against Moses, they're complaining against God. It says, and they, they, the people murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Okay, so there he tested them, and he was seeing what was in their hearts. Okay, so that's number two. That's the second event in which they complained. Go with me to Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through verses 3. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, uh, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel, they murmured, they complained. And Moses and uh, they complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God that we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for we have brought forth us, or for ye have brought forth us into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So they complained about food, about the lack of food. And they said, when we were in Egypt, we had flesh pots. Now, they're not talking particularly about what was in the pot. They just said it was a pot of meat. <laughs> Could have been oxtails or something. It's hard to say, but this, that was their complaint. So that's line number three. Let's take a look at event number four, Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 16, verses 12 through 20. I have heard the complaining of the children of Israel. Speak unto, them to, speak unto them, saying, At evening you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Now, he didn't say, I've heard their concerns. He didn't say, I heard their cries. He didn't say, I received their petitions. I don't remember reading that. What I did hear him say is, I keep hearing they're complaining. <laughs> That's, now, maybe you're coming across something different. You might have a translated version that says they, they petitioned the Lord. They, they, they besought him. They inquired of the Lord. You may have a translation that says that, but mine don't say that, you know. Mine said that the Lord called it complaining. You know, he said, I heard their complaints. They're rebelling against him and he's receiving it. Why? Because you have to give an account for every idle word that you say. You have to give an account. So be careful what you say. Remember, life or death and life is in the power of the tongue. Don't let it curse your present and your future. Don't let the kleptomaniac of blessings have permission to steal what God is trying to give you. Amen? Now, verse 13, it came to pass that at evening the quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that laid was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as a horse frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna, meaning they didn't know what it was. So they called it manna for they knew not or they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, this is the bread which the Lord hath given us to eat. So God gave them chicken and bread, <laughs> bread maybe even cornbread and chicken. He gave them quail. So that, you know, I'm just saying chicken, but he gave them quail. He gave them he gave them meat. He gave them meat and he gave them bread. He fed them. 
He was like, okay, fine. That's what you want. You won't complain. I'll give that to you. If that's what you want, I'll give it to you. Right? This is the thing which the Lord had commended. Gather it. Now watch. Moses says this. He says, God told me to tell you. Gather of it every man according to his eating. An omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tent. And the children of Israel did so, and they gathered some more, some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over. He that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. Moses said, let no man leave it till the morning. Here is the problem. Remember, everything that Moses is saying to him, God told him to tell them that. Moses said, let no, let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, nevertheless, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left of it until morning. And it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. So they, they disobeyed God then. Even though Moses was angry, God was the one displeased because they disobeyed God. God told Moses to instruct them, tell them this, and give them some instructions. However, they begin to waste it. They begin to waste it. And God had a problem with it. They had a problem. So that's, that's going to be for us number four, because they disobeyed the Lord God. That's number four. Okay? Number five, we're still in the same area. Exodus chapter 16, verses 22 through verses 29. It came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and they told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said. Tomorrow is the rest of the Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye shall bake today, and see that you will seethe, or boil that that you're going to boil. And that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning as Moses commanded them or as Moses bade. And it did not stink, neither was there any worms therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. So when they when they gathered too much, more than what was necessary, it began to stink. Okay? It began when they gathered according to the size of their household, when they begin to gather too much, it began to stink. All right. Now the commandment is the Sabbath is, is the, the Sabbath is upon us. You're not going to be going out there to gather anything uh, on, on the day of the Sabbath. So the day before the Sabbath, go and gather what you need. Bake, boil, whatever you're going to do, go, go and gather what you need. But on the Sabbath, don't go and gather anything. And don't you know that when the Sabbath came, nothing began to spoil, nothing began to stink? Because they did it according to what God said. But there is a problem. Verse 20, um, verse 24, and they laid it up till the morning as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worms therein. Verse 25, Moses said, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the Sabbath day for to gather and they found none. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out on his place on the seventh day. So, God told them to take up enough and don't worry about it. If you take up enough, 
uh, it won't spoil you. I'll take care of it to make sure it don't stink or don't spoil you. That way you don't go out on the Sabbath because there won't be any out there on the Sabbath. And what happened? The Sabbath came, they go out anyway. So that's number five. Okay, that's part of the count. Let's go to number six, Exodus chapter 17, verses one through three. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the, to the commandment of the Lord, and they pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide, they complained with Moses, and said, Give us water that we may drink. Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord your God? And the people thirsted, and the people thirsted there for water. The people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? That was a guilt trip that they con that was a card. They played the guilt trip card that they reminded you're responsible for us being in this situation. You're the one that pulled us out of Egypt just to put us in this situation. That's the card that they kept playing, the guilt trip card. So they kept tempted the Lord. They tempted the Lord God when he did that, when they did that. Moses cried unto the Lord saying, what shall I do unto this people? They, all, they be almost ready to stone me. So that's number six. Number seven, Exodus chapter 32, verses one through 10. Exodus chapter 32, verses one through 10. We're getting there. As I said, man has to give an account for every idle word. So all that complaining. Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 10. Here's what the word of the Lord says. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, this is when Moses was on the top of Mount Sinai for 40 days, for 40 nights he was there with the Lord. Uh, and because he took so long being up there with the Lord God, having a meeting with God, if you will, the people thought that he wasn't coming back. So the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which will make us a God, if you will, uh, which shall go before us. For as this is Moses, the men that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what has become of him, or we want not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which ones are in the ears of your wives and your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. So Aaron tells them, take the earrings out of your ears. Any gold that you find, earrings that's in your, your, your ears, your wives, your sons, your daughters, bring those earrings to me. And all the people break off the earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them out of their hand, and he fashioned it with a graven tool after he had made a molten calf. So he heated it up, formed it, and, and carved it into a calf, a golden calf. Okay, And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when, when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast day to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow, they offered burnt offering, and they brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to play. That phrase, rose up to play, is talking about they begin to um, dance provocatively. They begin to have sexual orgies, if you will. That's what it's, that's what it's talking about when it says that they rose up to play. It's talking about... Uh, they took the, the pagans' practices and, and the ones from Egypt um, and they began to uh, incorporate that into their walk and they began to adopt their sexual practices. Amen? So that's what was happening. Now, incidentally, I, I did a sermon on this. Uh, it's there in our archive. It's called Who's Minding the Sheep? And it talks about when somebody else is in charge and they're not a strong leader, the people will often take advantage of, 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 that, of the weakness of that leader. And they'll begin to shot call and all of a sudden the leader begins to become a people pleaser. He begins to deviate from the Lord 
and start listening more to the people rather than listening to God. The name of that sermon was called Who's Minding the Sheep? It's uh, you'll see that it, it's, it's there in our archive. Um, but this will be a number, this is number seven. So the people begin to rebel against the Lord. And let me finish this up. Uh, and the Lord said unto Moses in verse seven, go get thee down for the people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have, have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They've made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed, sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, and have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a rebellious or a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I would make thee a great nation. That's number seven, okay? Number eight, Numbers chapter 11, uh, verses one and two. Numbers chapter 11, no, verses one and two. So we're, we're coming up to where we are now. Numbers chapter 11, verses one and two. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and, and the Lord heard it. His anger was kindled. The fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the outermost parts of the camp. The people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. The, the people complained, and they got fire. The whole reason that there started to be fire, because God started to judge them for all the complaining. All the time, Moses was interceding for them, but it got to the point that God just, decide, just, just decided to start lighting them up. Literally speaking, he just started lighting them jokers up. Okay? Verse 9, same chapter, Numbers 11. Uh, I'm sorry, not, not verse 9. Numbers 11, verses 4 through 6. This is the, the ninth event, verses 4 through 6. And a mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. The children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? Okay, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now our soul is dried away and there is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. Okay, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's number nine. And lastly is what we've covered, numbers 10. Uh, I'm sorry, Numbers 14, verses 1 through 10. That represents number 10. Um, numbers 14, verses 1 through 4. Ver numbers 14, verses 1 through 4. That's your 10, uh, uh, when the Lord said, they provoked me these 10 times. That's what the Lord is talking about. These 10 different occasions to where they provoked him and, and caused him to, you know, caused him to start checking them for what they were doing and that's what he means so we're back in numbers 14 uh and and we'll reread verse 23 surely they have not surely they shall not see the land which i swear unto their fathers neither shall any of them uh, uh that provoke me see it but my servant caleb because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully him will i bring into the land whereunto he went and his seed shall possess it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites, they dwelt in the land. Tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Now what is God saying there? He's saying, I need you to start turning around and going back. I'm not sending you back to Egypt, but I'm not letting you go into the land. I need you to turn around and go back. None of y'all are going to make it into the land, okay? I've pardoned your transgressions, meaning that I'm not going to kill you instantly. However, those that actually slandered me, those that actually brought back the negative report to make the giants sound like they, that they were bigger than me, okay? I'm going to deal with them instantly, but my pardon will reign over the rest of y'all that I don't kill you instantly, 
Okay, so that's what the Lord is saying. So he said tomorrow, he says, uh, and he says, however, Caleb and Joshua, I'll give them because they stood up for me because they were of a different spirit. See, the Lord don't give us the spirit of fear. Go with me to go with me to Second Timothy, uh, chapter one, verse seven. Second Timothy, chapter one, verse seven. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I wanted to give you some scripture there that God, it's not God that gives us this spirit of fear. This spirit of fear comes from the enemy itself because the enemy gets us to not walk by faith, but to walk by sight. However, uh, when you look at Caleb, the Lord said that he was of a different of uh, di he was of a different spirit. He wasn't of this fear. He was of faith. He believed in God. Uh, he believed what God could do. He believed that what God set in front of them was for them, for for all of them to have. He believed in God. He began to walk by faith. He began to walk according to the promises of the Lord. Why would God promise something? Uh, to our fathers to give to us and then when we get to it the people are too strong for us for us to take it away from them why will we come all this way to not be able to take the land that doesn't make any sense power of love and of a sound mind when when God gives you a, a spirit of calmness you can reason on the promises of God and be like wait a minute God wouldn't bring us all this way for us to sit here and die out here. You talking foolish if that's what you're saying. God brought me all this way so that I can go forward and obtain the promises that was made unto me. He, he told me to delight myself in him and he shall, he shall give it to me. He shall bring it to pass. And why would, why would I believe otherwise? God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. That sound mind enables us to reason with the word, with the word of the Lord and, and, and to make sure that stuff that y'all talking don't line up with the promises that God have made. And up to this point, God had kept his word. And all the things that he's, that he's done and that he said he was going to do, he's been doing it. Power, love, and of a sound mind. Amen? So this is why God said that Caleb was of a different spirit, okay, uh, going on with this. So God tells him to turn around. And what is he saying when he tells them to turn around? There are some opportunities that when you miss it, it just don't come back around. You just can't get it. If God tells you to do something and you choose not to do something, the opportunity that presented itself based off of your obedience, that window just closed. And there's nothing you can do to reopen that window. It's gone and it, it won't come back. There, it's like that. There are some times that it's not like that, that if you drop the ball, it's okay. You can pick it up and move on. But there are certain events that has to do with God's timing that he'll offer it to you. And if you pass up on it, you can't come back and say, I changed my mind, I'm ready. No, it's, it's, it's a wrap. So we have to be ever so mindful that when God begins to speak to us, whether it's praying, he, he tells you, I need you to go pray right now, right now, right now, go pray right now. Whatever opportunity that was, a, that was presented itself that provoked this sense of urgency and you didn't move, Whatever was, whatever blessing was to come, it's gone. Amen. Verse 26, the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation? And you can see the, you can, you can almost just get a sense of God's disappointment, you know, because he's already said that he is going to pardon them, but he's still expressing his disappointment. These jokers have been a problem from the time that I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Even before I brought them out of the land, they was complaining. So he says, 
How long shall I bear with this evil generation which murmured against me? I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmured against me. Say unto them, as truly as I live, said the Lord, as you've spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according of your whole number, from twenty years old and upwards, which you have murmured against me, doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you to dwell therein, save or accept Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. So God is saying, oh man, this is some powerful stuff here. All of those from 20 years old and upward that complained, and you, you allow somebody to talk you out of what I was going to give you. You're not going to get that land. It's gone. It's off the table. It's a wrap. What was laid up for you is now gone and you can never get it back. That's a powerful thing right there. And God said the only ones that's going to make it from this generation that's 20 and up is, is uh, uh, Joshua and Caleb. And all of your young ones under 20 years old, they'll inherit the land too. But 20 years old and up. That means to me, if your birthday, if you were 19 years old and your birthday was next week, you just made the cut. <laughs> That's what that means to me. Because, you know, the Lord is real. He's real specific. He's very precise. And those that were 20 years old and upwards. They died in the wilderness. The only ones that were 20 years old and upward uh, were Caleb and Joshua that would be able to go into the land because they didn't rebel against the Lord. They was like, I don't care how big the giants is. My God, my God, greater is he that is in me than he that is within the world. My God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. My God, Yahweh. That's God. That's my God. And it was like, we are not going, I don't know about you. If y'all don't want it, I'll take it. You know, and God, God said, you can have it. It's yours. So remember when we started out the book of Numbers and we, and, and we were saying to keep, be mindful of this number, uh, uh, 603,000. Do you remember that? The exact number? Uh, 603,550, 603,550. Now, you're going to start to see the numbers diminish because it, Moses had asked the Lord to pardon the children of Israel, and he did, meaning that I will not wipe them all out. Their descendants shall go into the land. I'm not going to wipe them out. Their descendants, their descendants will go in. However, the children of Israel themselves, those that are 20 years old and upwards, they're not going to go into the land. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have them going in circles in the wilderness until they, die, until they all die off. And once they all die off and those that were under 20 at the time that I made the decree, once their relatives die, once their, their, the adults die off, their mothers, their fathers, their uncles, you know, I'll let them come into the land. But the older ones, you won't be able to go into the land until you die. And, and, and they won't be able to go into the land. They need to die in the wilderness. So that's what God is saying. And that's a powerful thing here. Once it's off the table, you can't get it back. Hmm? Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upwards which you've murmured against me. Doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you to dwell therein. And the, only, the exception to that is Caleb and Joshua. But your little ones which you sh which ye said should be a prey. The, remember when y'all said and this is, the, this is the, how the Lord is saying it. Remember when you said that I led you and your children out here so that your children, your children can be captive, your children can, uh, can be taken as hostages and slaves? Guess what? They are going to be brought into the land of Canaan, the very land that you forsook. I'll see to it that they inherit it and that you don't get it, right? 
This is what the Lord is saying. But your little ones, which you sh which said, which ye say should be a prey, them them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as far as you, uh, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. So God says it's going to take forty years for that whole generation to die off. That is a big deal. So this is how that number shifts. It turns out that the book of Numbers, it begins to become a real sad book because they're right on the outskirts of this land of God fulfilling, fulfilling the promise that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is about to bring them in. He sends some scouts to go out ahead and to see, to bring back evidence and to see how great the land was. But God also tested their hearts to see if they really wanted it. And when 10 people, words became more powerful than God's words in itself. When that happened, God seen that their hearts did not want anything and that their hearts despised them. It, it required more of what man had to offer than what God had to offer. And that's what messes people up today. Man will offer you lotteries and cars and houses and everything. God is offering you treasures in heaven and eternal life. And people decide to take things now. Then walk with God up the road and live forever with those things that he has in store for him. And that's, it's a sad state of affairs that men choose death more than they choose life. So God says, your children shall wander in the wilderness for 40 years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of days which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year shall you bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise. That is heavy. So the Lord is saying, again, every day, remember, they had a 40-day mission, the spies. And because you believed them, every day will be a year. And if there was 40 days that they were gone, there should be 40 years that you're not in the land, okay? And in those 40 years, you're going to die. So most of them just received a, a uh, you know how you, w w when, when somebody is convicted with the death penalty and the, the execution date is set, their execution date was set. The, the only difference is they didn't know specifically what day, but they knew from now until 40 years from now, they were going to die within that 40 years. The only ones that wasn't going to die was Caleb and Joshua and anybody under 20 years old from the time of this decree. But everybody else 20 years old and upwards, they were going to die uh, by the end of that, the, by the time of the arrival of the 40 years or before the 40 years were complete. That is very sad. They were just given the death penalty and, and, and found out that in that time they would be dying between now and 40 years. So, uh, I the Lord, it says, I the Lord have said I've surely, that I will surely do it unto this evil congregation that are gathered together against me. Now let me reread that because this is, this is powerful too what he just said. I the Lord have said, I surely do it, I will surely do it unto this evil generation that are gathered together against me. He's swearing by none other but himself that this was going to happen, that y'all will fall before you make it into the land. I guarantee you, you're going to die. I'm, I can swear by nothing greater than myself. And because I say it, because I've said it, my word shall not pass, it shall not fall to the ground. It shall come to pass. That's what God is saying. Powerful, powerful, powerful. He swore by none greater than, because there is none greater than himself. So he swore by himself 
that what he said is going to happen. Okay? So he goes on to say, In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation to complain or to murmur against him, by bringing up a slander upon the land, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land, died by the plague before the Lord. So the Lord loosed the plague immediately. And those men, those ten men, those, those ten of the twelve that came back and slandered, they died by the plague. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, they lived still. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people murmured greatly, so the, or the people mourned, I'm sorry, the people mourned greatly. And they rose up early in the morning, and they got them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and we will go up unto the place which the Lord has promised. We have sinned. But there is some things that can't be undone. See, one thing about God is he's not going to force anything on you. And once you... Once he put it on your plate and you refuse the plate, he gives it to somebody else because you didn't want it. It was meant for you to have, but you chose to refuse it. You rebelled against the gift of the Lord. Moved away. He put it to somebody else. Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord? But it shall not prosper. So what's going on here? So the next day, the people, they, they, they try to get everybody's attention. They say, hey, you know what? We messed up. We messed up. We need to own it. So let's go and let's get to the top of the mountain and let's show the Lord that we're ready. Because see, now, after things calm down, remember you're crying all night long about, oh, we're going we to die by these giants. You're crying all night long. Now, after the Lord said that you're going to be wiped out, I'm going to kill you, and, and you know what God is capable of. And you know that whatever God has said, he has done. All of a sudden now, you're like, oh, I don't want to die out here. I don't want this to, I don't want to be on a death sentence while I'm out here. Let's show up and let God know we are ready. Well, don't you know you're still transgressing the commandments of the Lord because the Lord said, turn ye back around toward the Red Sea. And instead of you doing that, you're going forward. You're still, and that's why Moses said, you're still transgressing the commandment of the Lord. You're still being disobedient. He told you no, and you're going to say yes. What, what are you doing? And he says, what you're doing will not prosper because the Lord will not be with you. Basically, he turned them over to themselves. Go, so in verse 42, Moses said, go not up for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites, they are there before you and you shall fall by the sword because you are turned away from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Then the Amalekites came down. The Canaanites dwelt in that hill, or the Canaanites rather which dwelt in that hill, and they smote them, they discomforted them, even unto... Uh, uh, Hormath, or that discomforted, they drove them back, even back to Hormath. So that's, uh, that's going to take care of that. Uh, I told you, there was a lot there to cover. We wanted to make sure that you can see why God just, after all the long suffering, this is not like it was one event, and then the Lord said, that's it, let me, you know, let me just do away. It went back from the time that they left out of Egypt all the way to this time now, and the whole reason that God said that, that the Lord Jesus said that you have to give an account, that's what's written in the word. You have to give an account. And so this is why God is able to say these 10 times that they've provoked me because we all have to give an account 
of 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 every word that has said out of that's been said out of our mouths, whether good or bad. So we have to start watching what we say. And if we notice that we're speaking a whole lot of negative and a whole a whole less positive, not anything positive, but a whole lot of negative, it's because that's what's filled in you. So you have to replace it with goodness. You have to start replacing things with wholesomeness. A lot of us got a lot of rap songs and a lot of uh, uh, worldly songs, uh, you know, a lot of uh, um, uh, hardcore rap and hardcore rock and roll, um, a lot of nasty lyrics to things, a lot of our TV habits are, are full of Cinemax and HBO and Showtime contents, uh, a, a lot of stuff like that. It, you fill yourself up with that negativity and, and it's, that's darkness. You start filling yourself up with darkness, then you begin to speak with darkness because you can only put so much inside of you before it starts seeping out of you. So you fill yourself with darkness, you begin to speak darkness. You fill yourself with light and life, you begin to speak that. Whatever you fill yourself up with, that's what you begin to speak. So if you notice that you're constantly speaking negative and you're constantly speaking dark and, and you speak in poverty, you're not speaking blessings, you're speaking poverty, you're speaking war and chaos, you're speaking fear, uh, uh, if you're not speaking love, you're speaking hate, start filling yourself up with the love of God and the word of Christ Jesus. Start filling yourself up with the word of Christ. Start filling yourself up with word and watch your, watch your tongue begin to minister love and peace. Huh? The righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Amen? Eternal God, we thank you for the word that we received. We thank you for the events that were recorded and written for our understanding. God, I pray that I've taken nothing out of context. I pray that I delivered it as it was in my spirit to do so. More than anything and more than all things, I pray that you are glorified. And I pray that those that had heard are not only hearers but doers of the word that they were able to receive it in simplicity, that they were able to apprehend and comprehend the meaning and the understanding of what was said to them. Father, I hope that lives are changed, that men draw unto thee, that men seek your face and find it, discover your ways and apply it. I pray that, that shackles are, breaking, are broken off of people people begin to examine themselves and see what it is that's in their heart. If there be anything that is against thee, that their heart would be purged and filled with those things that are for God. Praise and love and adoration of the Most High God. I pray this prayer concerning those whom you've caused to hear this word and to, to sit and sup through this Bible study. Father, that their lives would be drawn closer to you and that they would be found obedient, doers of the word of God, full of praise unto thee. Lord, thank you for this word. It causes me to examine my own life, Lord God. And I thank you for all the path that you've set before us to travel, that we may learn along with the children, that we may eat along with the children. I thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, go with me quickly. Uh, Bible study is a little long today, and we praise God and we thank him for it. Uh, go with me to Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. This is an invitation given uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ unto all, not just the children of Israel, but unto all. Look at what it says here. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy 
and my burden is light. Now, we spoke earlier in the Bible study about uh, when salvation is being offered unto you. The one thing, I can't say the first thing, but one of the things that the enemy tries to do is to distort the journey that leads to the other side. The, the enemy tries to tell you, uh, the enemy and its, and its angels, its servants, its ministering uh, uh, demons, will try to persuade you and in in it begins to try to change the narrative to say that you're not compatible with that life. You've done this and done that for so long, it hasn't been that bad for you. Uh, but if you go this way, you can't conform to that life. It takes a special kind of person. See, the enemy is not trying to convince you that God doesn't exist. The enemy is not trying to convince you um, that there isn't a, a good or, or an evil. That's not it. The enemy is changing the narratives by telling you that you can't do it. Uh, and the penalty is not as bad as what somebody makes it seem. God is not coming right. Jesus is not coming back that, that, that soon. Now is the time for you to play all you want to. Rise up and play before it, before it becomes too late. Rise up and play. Don't worry about that stuff right now. The time will come. This is what the enemy will try to seduce you with. And you'll end up listening Think you ha thinking that you have time. And that's what the enemy is trying to do is change the narrative to make you think you got time, time that you don't have. Hmm? And all of a sudden, this invitation that's being given to you, you begin to put it off. The sense of urgency that it, that is being offered in, the tone that is being offered as a sense of urgency, all of a sudden you begin to take your time. You ever watch children um, get on a school bus and you can watch them, the bus will pull up at a certain time, maybe the bus will pull up at 6.30, 6.35, and they may stay way down the street, but they just taking their time walking. And I guess the bus drivers are told that if you see them walking, don't leave them, wait for them to get there. That's... <laughs> it's the wrong advice to give them because a child should know that a bus driver should not wait if, if you're not running to get to that bus. First of all, you're told to be there at 6.30 or 6.35, whatever you're told to be there at. And all of a sudden, you think the bus is going to wait for you. So you're slowing up and you're just walking and taking your time, walking and taking your time. Because for some reason, you just know that driver won't leave because they've spotted you and they have to wait for you to get there before they can take off. And this is the way you've been brought up your life to think that people have to wait for you. And the problem is that's leading you away from God because that's not the way the system is. Let me give you one quick scripture before we finish, uh, as, as we're finishing this up. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 55, I believe. Isaiah chapter 55. Look at what this says here. We've covered this scripture before. Uh, it's actually, it's, yeah, Isaiah 55 verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 55 verse 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may yet be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. That means that as you see him, hurry up and get to him. Seek him while he may yet be found. So if you see him, hurry up and get to him before he takes off. Right? It says, a call upon him while he is near. Because if you take too much time trying to get to him, he won't be near again. He's going to be too far for you to get to. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the upright man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and our God and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. But seek him while he is near. 
If you take your time and you listen to the enemy and the enemy try to convince you that you got time and there is no sense of urgency, it will become too late. Now is the time. If you feel in a tugging at your heart or a conviction in your spirit, it is the Lord letting you know we need to do something about this now, not later, but now. Amen. So God gives Jesus uh, the right to invite whoever he will into the kingdom. So Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest I will give unto you rest. I'll give you rest. Some of you are not willing to rest yet because you got so much play in you. And the only reason why you got so much play is because you think you have still so much time. So those of you that have weighed everything and you looked at the plagues that are going on, the uh, 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 coronavirus. I think that there's this virus that's out there now, and and it's it's starting to hit the United States, and and masks are leaving off the shelves. Plagues are, are happening, and and wars, and rumors of wars, and the the weather is changing, and the earthquake, and various things that are happening. Some people are starting to say, maybe we're at the end. And for those people that have looked at their lives and have and have looked at what's going on, that there may be some kind of judgment happening right now. It is time for me to call upon the Lord because he is offering. Let me take his advice. See, don't be like what what was recorded that we've just read about the children of Israel when God was offering them. Uh, uh, the land of Canaan to where they can come in and rest. He was offering them somewhere to where they can rest permanently from their journey. And they refused it. It is now God is offering through his son unto you rest. Are you going to refuse him like the children of Israel has done at the time of that recording, at the time of that event? Are you going to turn down what God was offering unto them? Are you going to turn that down for yourself? Will you say, I, I can't conform to that life. I'm not ready for that yet. I just as soon as go back to Egypt and kick it there because at least I knew everything there. That's too, that life is too hard for me. Will you be that person? Those of you that are ready to apprehend, are you going to be Caleb? Are you going to be Jacob and say, I'm ready. I accept what the gift that you're offering. You're offering me some rest. I'll take that right now. For those of you that are willing to accept God's gift, follow me to Romans chapter 10. And let's look at verses 9 through 13. Here's what the word of the Lord says. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Remember what I said, whatever you fill yourself up with, it begins to overflow and come out. If you fill yourself up with the belief, the truth and the belief that Jesus is the only begotten son of God and you make him Lord, the overflowing of that belief and faith will come out of your mouth and you should be able to confess that Jesus is Lord and call upon him so you should be saved. Hmm? Remember, whatever you fill yourself up with in your heart, it's going to overflow and come out of, the, uh, of, of, of this entry point and you won't be able to but be helped. You, you can't help but speak what has filled your heart. And if you believe, if, it's, if you filled your heart with the truth that Jesus can save and that he is the, be, the only begotten son of God and that he is the way, the truth, and the life and that no man can come unto the Father except through Jesus Christ. If you believe that Jesus came, 
laid down his life for us and then God brought him back to life and resurrected him up from the dead and ascended him up into heaven. If you believe that with all your heart and you confess that with your mouth, you make Jesus your Lord and you call upon him, you shall be saved. He promises to save you. Amen? Now, it requires you to repent of all your ways because you can't have two lives. You can't have Canaan and you can't have Egypt together. It has to be one or the other. One foot can't be in Canaan while the other foot is in Egypt. It don't work like that. You have to choose one or the other, the kingdom of God or the kingdoms of this world. You have to decide. But if ye be for God, then you follow him into his heavenly abode, into the kingdom of righteousness. Follow him there and plant yourself there in his presence. And it's going to be a little hard at first because you have to repent of your ways. Those things that you've been doing, all that sin, all that complaining, all that murmuring, they don't work in the kingdom of God. Instead of you being rebellious against God, it's time for you to embrace him, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Amen? For with the heart man uh, believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jews and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If I was you, I would stop this recording, uh, uh, this broadcast. I would pause it and I would call upon the name of the Lord right now. Let him know, Lord God, I have repented. I confess my sins unto you. I call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he can save me from my sins. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name, I confess him to be Lord and Savior. Save me from my sins. Wash me so that I may clean. Father, I will obey. I will obey the Lord Jesus Christ. I follow after you. I seek after you. I worship you in spirit and in truth. Save me, Lord. I believe you. I believe in you and I believe you. I receive the truth that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. And I believe, Lord, that you have rose, that you have risen Jesus from the dead. If you believe and you confess, he shall save you. Your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You say, Lord Jesus, I call on you right now to save me from my sins. Now, go with me to 1 John uh, chapter 1 verses 8 through 10 first John chapter 1 verses 8 through 10 and here's what the word of the Lord says for it said if we say that we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness we have to repent repentance is turning away from your sin. It is not saying I'm sorry and then going back to the sin. It is turning away from your sins once and for all. And the, those things that you are confessing are the things that you have, uh, 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 the sins that you have let go of. Why should you get credit for something that you haven't let go of? Hmm? You're getting credit for what you have let go of, that which you have turned over to God. You're saying that I've sinned and I, I did this, I did this, I did that, and I did that. Those sins, and but you can tell them that I've done it, I've been guilty of the offense of it, but I stopped doing it. I've turned away from it once and for all, and I hand it over to you. And you know what God does? He forgives you for the sin, and he cleanses you of all unrighteousness. Now, as we gave an earlier example, if you've robbed a bank, if you've killed somebody, any crimes that you have committed, God still forgives you of those things. But 
the offense has still went out from among you. That means that you still have to take responsibility for what you have done. There may be a, 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 a court cost to you, meaning that uh, you have to appear before a judge based on your sins, based on what you've committed, whatever crime that your sin have caused you to commit, you still have to atone for that. God forgives you so that you don't die from it, but the, the cost of that crime, you still have to atone for. So I want to make sure that you have understanding of that. Amen? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You have to take responsibility for what you've done wrong. If you do not take responsibility for it, God can't do anything to help you. If you have to look at where you're broken, if you can't confess where you're broke, then you can't be healed. Amen? Uh, God is a respectable God, and he is not going to do anything that you don't want him to do for you. It just don't work like that. And if you are hiding that from him, he is not going to force you to hand it over. If you are hiding that sin, that iniquity, he is not going to force you to hand it over. You're just going to be charged with the, with, with the uh, rebellion against God through that particular sin. Until you are ready to once and for all let it go, confess, and, and, and tell God about it. Amen? Lastly, go with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 42. This particular event that we are about to cover took place on this particular day of Pentecost. On this particular day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, uh, as we read in the Bible, the scripture says that uh, they were that God was in a cloud by day and a fire by night. That was his presence with them, a cloud in the day and a fire by night. Amen. Now God places his presence inside of us, just as he was with the children of Israel day and night. His presence actually now dwells inside of us, those of us that are saved. Uh, we have a spirit inside of us, and it's their day and night. Uh, when this started, it started here on this day of Pentecost, which we are about to read, this particular day of Pentecost. The Spirit of God fell down from heaven, fell upon the disciples as they were gathered together on this day of Pentecost. And not only did the Holy Ghost fall upon them, but it came inside of their vessels. It began to inhabit their vessels. Just as God had inhabited the tabernacle, this is the tabernacle now, and the Spirit of the Lord inhabits the tabernacle. Amen? Now, everybody that, had, that were present of this day of observation, this day of Pentecost, if they were from Asia, if they were from Africa, if they were from Rome, wherever they were from, when the Spirit uh, Phil came inside of the disciples, it began to use their tongue to minister to those that were present. And what, what they were hearing, if you were from Asia, Africa, Rome, wherever you were from, what you began to hear was one of the 12 disciples speaking in your native language. So if you were from Africa, you heard the African dialect. If you were from Asia, you heard the Asian dialect. If you were from China or wherever you were from, if you were from Rome, you heard the Greek or you heard the Roman accent, the Roman dialect. And the Holy Ghost did that to get their attention. Once the Holy Ghost had their attention, those, those worshipers, once the Holy Ghost had their attention, Peter began to minister to them. He began to preach a sermon. Verse 36, we're coming in towards the end of the sermon that Peter spoke to those that were here those that were there. Therefore, to let all the house of Israel know surely that God had made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, I don't believe Peter was saying that there are those of you present that have taken the nails and you specifically drove the nails through the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. You specifically nailed him up on a cross. 
he's not speaking that literally, but in a spiritual sense, he said, those of you that rebelled against the Lord Jesus Christ, you are no, you are no more, uh, uh, you are just as guilty than those that actually drove the nails through the cross. So you may not have been the one to be there to do it, but a rebellious lifestyle make you just as complicit as those that had done that to Jesus. And that's what Peter was telling him. And don't you know that that goes to us too? You may not have been the one to drive the nails through his hands or the nails through his feet. But if you have rejected Jesus as the Christ and as the only begotten son of God, if you have not obeyed him, you are just as complicit to those as those that had nailed him to the cross. Peter lets them know that he is not only Lord, but he is the Christ, the anointed one that came from God. Now, when they heard this, they were convicted. They were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, when you hear a good word, when you hear a good sermon, you heard this Bible study. When there are things that you hear that begins to convict you or prick you in your heart, it's being done, that, that convicting, that conscience that's happening, um, it's meant for you to change something that's been broken about you. Something, some part of you that has been rebellious against God. When you begin to hear this, God is trying to get you to line that part that's broken about you, trying to line that up with him. Okay? When you're convicted, whenever you hear something that convicts you, it's meant that it's supposed to, you're supposed to give that area of your life some attention so that it doesn't become your downfall. Amen? So when they heard Peter preach this sermon, they were convicted and they wanted to do something about the way they were feeling. And so they asked Peter and the arrest and the rest of the apostles. They said, men, brethren, what shall we do? It's not meant for you to hear a good sermon and to say amen and to go back to the sin. It's meant for you to hear a word that convicts you. It's meant for you to get up and do something about it because that's God trying to save you with the first through the first step of conviction. Amen. He's trying to save you. Amen. Then Peter said unto them in verse 38, repent. We talked about repentance. We talked about repenting of your sin and confessing your faults before the Lord Jesus Christ. We talked about repentance. We talked about confession. And then we were talking about a calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now uh, you'll receive that you'll go through baptism. So look at what Peter said. Repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repent, uh, uh, confess your faults, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, call upon him, and then go and get baptized. Okay, go and get baptized. Now, what is baptism? Baptism is a ceremony in which you are taken and you are fully submerged in the water and you are immediately brought up out of the water. The reason why it's done is because Christ, he wasn't partially dead. When he gave up the ghost on the cross, he, he actually died. They took Christ down off the cross and they placed him in a tomb. He laid in that tomb for three days and three nights. He was laid to rest in the tomb. After three days and three nights, he was brought back to life. When you are uh, being laid down in, the t in, in baptism, in a tub of baptism, you are being laid to rest in Christ Jesus. In other words, you are being buried in Christ Jesus. And when you come up out of the water, you come up in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Your old man goes down in the water. You're being buried in Christ Jesus. Your new man comes up out of the water. You come up in the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Your, old, your, your man is made new. Old things are passed away. Amen? So all of your sins, everything has been washed away. It's not that you've been, you've been soaping water clean. 
is that you've been spiritually claimed. Amen. Your old man goes down. Your new man comes up. This is why you want to get it done. You're ceremonially clean now. Amen. Hold your place there. Go with me to Romans chapter six. Let's take a look at verses three through verses six. Romans chapter six, verses three to verses six. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized uh, into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into his death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of of his resurrection knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we shall not serve sin so once you're brought up out of the water you're you're cleansed from all unrighteousness everything that you've done prior to, to, to baptism you're cleansed from all un unrighteousness now you go forth and you sin no more. You can stand th through Jesus Christ. You can now come to the throne of the Father. You, you didn't have access to him before. Now, through Jesus Christ, you have access to the Lord God. Why? Because when Jesus was resurrected, uh, 40 days after his resurrection, he was ascended up into heaven and he now resides on God's right hand side. Well, when you were resurrected in Jesus Christ, this as, just as Jesus now has access to God, he's by God's right hand side, you have access to God. Jesus ripped the veil. So now you can come and you now have access to him to where you can pray with him. And because of that, soon after, God is going to place his spirit inside of you. Amen. Jesus gave us access to God. Man, so now we have that. You didn't have that before. You couldn't because you were filthy. Now you're under the righteousness of Jesus Christ and you now have access to the Father. Amen? It says, so you are baptized. He, so Peter tells them to get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we talked about that a bit. God was with the children of Israel by cloud in the daytime and by a, a fire at night. Well, now that's going that that water and that fire that's going to be inside of you. That's God's presence. It's going to dwell inside of you, and it's going to be chiseling. It's going to be burning some things off, chiseling, sculpting some things. Uh, uh, it's 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 going to make you look at some things about yourself. That, that's get, that he's getting rid of. He's shaping you up. He's conforming you into the image of the, his only begotten son. And some things is going to hurt because he's breaking some things off on you that he doesn't want there. Amen? So that's what the Holy Ghost does for us. Amen? For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. This should give you hope you should praise God because of this. When you look at your children and they may not be where you want them to be, but give glory to God because there is hope for them. As there is hope for us and God begins to save us and look how far off we were from God, there is hope for them too. Amen. And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this lawless, rebellious, godless generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So Peter said, he warned them, he urged them, put yourself in position to get saved. You waiting for a sign, what are you waiting for before you get saved? It's, in, it's not up to God, it's up to you to put yourself in position to get saved. Hmm? If, if the, 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 the word is being preached unto you so that you can either accept it or reject it. The gift is offered. What did Jesus say? Come unto me, all 
ye that labor and are heavy laden. So all of you have an opportunity to be saved. Some people just won't take they just won't take him up on his offer. Just like the children of Israel shied away from, from the ultimate gift, some people will still be that way today. But don't be that person. If you hear it, receive it, do something about what you just received. Amen? And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Whatever God has done to save you, don't take your foot off the pedal. Keep it moving. Don't stop and look back. Don't become stagnant. If you were praying, if you've been fasting, uh, if you've been fellowshipping, if you've been studying the word, don't take your foot off the pedal. Continue to do those things. Yea, do those things even the more so. Amen. Eternal God, we pray, we first we thank you for all that you've done and continue to do. We thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for addressing our concerns. We thank you for long suffering. We thank you for every word that's been recorded in scripture and been preserved that we can receive the instruction of it and apply it to our lives that we may walk closer with you in obedience. Now, Father, we also give you praise for those names that you have written in the Lamb's book of life. Father, we pray that you would bless the relationship that you have called men to have with you. And those that you pulled out of the world and have brought into your kingdom, we pray for them that they would prosper, that they would please you, that they would be brought up in the stature, the image and the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ that they would worship you in spirit and in truth, and they would not let the world influence them away from anything that you would love to give them and love for them to have. Father, I pray for them that they would transition from milk to meat. And Father, that they would glorify you, that they would pronounce and declare your truths. Thank you for cleansing them. Thank you for forgiving them. Father, we pray for them, that they would be used to draw more, that the size of our family will continue to increase. God, I thank you for the word. I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your holy angels. And Jesus, I thank you for preparing a place for us and making a way for us to stand before the Father in prayer and to have access to his throne. Father, we thank you for all things, and we bless you because you are worthy to be praised and to be blessed. We bless you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, thank you for allowing my family and I to be a part of your Bible study. I thank you for your support, for your prayers and your support. Um, you have been tremendous in the way that you've helped us. Um, the Lord is helping to take care of my family and I as, as we transition. Uh, uh, and even from, from one job to uh, going into another job, I, I got a job interview Tuesday. Um, and I, I thank God for, for what he's been doing. And, and uh, I thank him for giving me faith to believe in him. You know, I look at myself being, I'm 47 years old, so I've been at one job over 20 years. Um, I'm having to retool, uh, sharpen whatever skills I did have and acquire new skills so that I can stay competitive. Amen. And, and I bless God for the path and the skill set that he's allowed me to acquire and, and the mindset to not look at something as being too great or too difficult but believing that if God be for me, who could possibly stand against me? Uh, so I bless you for, for again, uh, for your support and your prayers. Amen. And I know that if God can do it for me, um, surely he would do it for many others because God is no respect of, uh, no respect of persons. Uh, given our benediction, it's coming from uh, Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. 
And I'm a living witness that he has kept all of us. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I loose these blessings in your life and I pray that you receive it and praise God for having the blessings being bestowed upon you. In Jesus' name, receive it right now in Jesus' name. God is good to all of us. We praise him, Lord. Thank you for what you've just bestowed upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you for allowing us to be a part of your Bible study. And we'll, Lord willing, see you for our next broadcast. Walk in the blessings of the Lord. They're put there for you. Amen. This has been a United Body of Christ Church video production. You can visit our website at www.ubcchurch.org.